Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Veronica, team, and the people from Action uh, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll be doing essentially two different presentations. The first one, which is the longest one, uh, it's going to be about uh, IPv6 security tools. Okay. Uh, essentially, I will be showing how to run some tools to do some stuff. And with a little bit of background, because obviously the idea is not just to show you to run tools without you know, knowing uh, uh, you know, how they work or why they work the way they work. And then the second one is going uh, to be about like, an update of uh, recent work that has been done at the ITF, uh, you know, things that have changed in the, you know, in the IPv6 standards. Uh, brief introduction about myself. I work as a security researcher and consultant. I've done quite a bit of work at the ITF. Um, most of that has been about IPv6, and most of the stuff that I've done about IPv6 have been like essentially security patches, you could think. So it's like uh, things that I found in the protocol that I thought that you know needed an improvement, and eventually some of those ended up uh, in RFCs, which updated the existing specifications. Uh, I do write articles for a website, Tech Target. Uh, I have also worked on a, on a toolkit, an IPv6 toolkit. This is the one that we will use for most of the, of the tests. Uh, I also run an IPv6 hackers mailing list. Obviously, it's open, free, and all of that. And uh, essentially, you find if you are trying to copy those links, the easier one is the one at the bottom, which just has pointers to the other places. Um, first of all, a disclaimer before I forget. Um, obviously, this presentation is going to focus about security issues. And you know the way in which I view these things, I mean, not about B6 specifically, but about any protocol, uh, is that obviously you do a security assessment, you find problems, you try to come up with ways to fix that. But what I'm trying to make it clear is that whatever we or whatever I discuss in this presentation should shouldn't be taken as a, okay, IPv6 has problems, we shouldn't deploy it, okay? Because at times people get the, uh, you know, usually at uh, uh, those times that I, I have spoken at yeah, IPv6 uh, task forces on councils, if I don't make the, this, this disclaimer beforehand, beforehand, then they end up saying, okay, people probably got the wrong impression. So I'm trying to make the, the, that point very clear. Uh, I think it's clear to everyone that is here why we need IPv6, and it's not under the question whether we should deploy it or not. So we assume that we are deploying it, and you know, since we are doing it, we are trying to find and see what are the things that we could do better in terms of security. Okay. Uh, for the same reason, I mean, some of the tools that um, we will use, you could portray them as assessment tools or attack tools or whatever way you want. I mean, this is supposed to be used in lab uh, or against your own network, not against other people's network, okay? Just to make the disclaimer clear. So uh, let's first of all introduce uh, the tools that we will be using. First of all, uh, if you haven't heard about it, you should have. Uh, there's a toolkit called THC IPv6 or the Hacker's Choice IPv6 toolkit. For a long, long time, it, has, it was the only toolkit that there was available to, uh, let's say, perform IPv6 attacks. I think that's very, very important. Um, so these people, uh, it's a guy from Germany, Mark Oise, or I don't know how you pronounce his last name. Um, he essentially provided the community with the first tool, the first toolkit that you could actually you know, employ, for example, in a lab to try to reproduce attacks, or if you were, for example, implementing mitigations to actually assess whether you know, your mitigations were actually mitigating the stuff that they were supposed to or not. Some uh, features about this uh, toolkit, first of all, for most of the tools, it's easy to use them uh, without much knowledge. So it's quite often the case that you can you know, just run one tool, specify the target, and for example, if it's a DOS, you get what you expect, but without necessarily understanding the background for that. Uh, it runs, so you can run this toolkit on Linux with an Ethernet interface, uh, and it's obviously free software, and this is the home page for this toolkit. Same thing as the other one, the one that I produced myself, both of these are, if you use, for example, Debian, it's in the package system, so you can install it with apt-get and so on. Uh, but obviously, uh, for the most part, it's better if you use Git to sync with the source code because it's much more up-to-date. Um, so we will use this toolkit for some of the stuff that we will be doing. 
Uh, my view of this toolkit is that generally if one of the attacks that you are trying to perform is covered by this toolkit, well, it's easier to use. You usually just specify the target and that's it. Now, obviously, that comes as, as, uh, at a price, if you want, that if you want to tweak the attack or something like that, at times it's not possible. Uh, there is the other one that I did, uh, which essentially had different goals for a number of reasons. Um, it was essentially a toolkit that was produced to ship to vendors so that they could actually assess their own implementations. The funny part is that there was a lot of work put into this, a lot of work put into the documentation, but let's say vendors didn't do much of a good job in that sense. Uh, even there were stuff that we reported to vendors and then a year later they came up with a vulnerability advisory because they had found that stuff by themselves. So. Um, goals with this toolkit, um, well I tried to make it clean, portable and secure to the extent that was possible. That was just me inflicting pain on myself. Uh, I didn't want to produce something that was supposed to be a security tool and then, you know, shipping, uh, let's say, not so good code, to call it some way. Um, the documentation probably is the most unpleasant part of the toolkit to produce. But since it had to be shipped to vendors, well, you had to assume that the person receiving the toolkit probably wasn't, wasn't going to be the, one, the same one using the toolkit. So there's a lot of work put into that. So if you do man and the name of each of the, or each of the tools, you will get all the help that you expect, examples, and so on. Uh, these are some of the, uh, say, features. Supported operating systems, most of the popular BSDs, um, Mac OS, and Linux. Uh, there's a home page and you can also, that's what I would expect you to do is if you want to use the toolkit, uh, try to use the Git repository because that's the most up-to-date version of it. Usually for the Linux packages, it takes a while to, you know, to synchronize. Uh, what's, let's say, the downside, if you want, of this toolkit? It's make, it makes it very easy to, uh, whatever idea you have in mind, it makes it easy to actually apply that idea to a network, but you have to know what you want to do. So I know a lot of people that get really frustrated about this toolkit because they say, okay, I downloaded the toolkit, there were you know, 10 tools, I run the tools, nothing crashed. Well, it's kind of like uh, it's expected to work that way, okay? So it's a tool that makes it easy for you to, you know, set different stuff in different protocols, but you have to know what you are tweaking. Otherwise, for most of the part, except for a couple of tools, they will, no, they will not do anything, okay? So, uh, what I will do throughout this um, presentation is essentially cover some of the topics for which these, these toolkits have tools. Obviously, not all of them, and uh, to the extent that I, that was possible, I tried to uh, you know include some background because the idea or what I like about working with protocols is you know understand you know how things work, not just you know run a tool and you get the denial of service without actually understanding what what happened uh, you know behind the scenes. So uh, first topic is about address scanning, and before I get into the the let's say the technical uh, stuff. Uh, I also like you, also, uh, or I would encourage you if, let's say, there's something uh, with which you don't agree, or you have a different point of view, or something in between, or even more extreme, uh, please raise your hand and make the comment. Uh, that's, you know, perfect on my side. Uh, if I was wrong on something, I might learn something, and otherwise it's the other way around, okay? But that makes the talk interesting to me. I mean, this is stuff that I have read already, but you might come up with a different point of view, angle, or some objection about what I'm saying, and that's the part that is mostly interesting for me. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, I think I can put this here. Address scanning. So, First of all, um, before getting into the details on how you do RS scanning for IPv6, it's interesting to think about how we do it in IPv4, okay? In IPv4, obviously, uh, when you try to find uh, systems by doing an address scan, you essentially do a brute force address scan. And why? Well, because the search space is very small. So there's no sense, it doesn't make any sense to actually you know, waste your brain in coming up with you know, more interesting ways in doing things if you can do a really 
you know, you, you can, let's say, get a good results with a very bad job, in a sense. Um, you know, in the case that, you know, you have a slash 24 or something, you know, it's even, not even minutes at times, okay? Um, in IPv6, obviously, that's totally different. Because if we assume, for example, that uh, you know, the default subnet is a slash 64, then you have 64 bits to play with for the interface ID or for the host addresses, if you want. So if you just wanted to go through the whole address space, it would be like 2 elevated to the 64 power to you know, try every possible combination. Uh, obviously, that's unfeasible. Uh, now, if we try to, let's say, um, you know, figure out how to do scanning in IPv6 networks, uh, essentially there are two different problems. One is to perform uh, scanning attacks on local networks, and a totally different one, and more difficult, is to do address scans for remote networks, okay? So we will discuss both of these. Um, okay. So first of all, uh, let's start with the um, address scans for local networks. Well, in IPv6, you might know that you have multicast addresses that can be employed to identify all of the systems on the local network. There's like all nodes link local multicast address, and essentially you could just, for example, send a ping packet to that address, and you would be able to learn all of the locally connected systems. That's kind of like the equivalent of uh, using, let's say, 255.255, blah, blah, in the IPv4 world, okay? So you might think, okay, well, there's no much more to discuss here. Uh, just use ping and problem solved. Kind of, uh, I tried that, but the problem is that Windows, if you send just a, a multicasted ping packet, they will not respond to that packet. So by sending a multicasted ping, you can learn about you know, BSDs, you can learn about Linux and other systems, but not about Windows. So we had to find something else to throw on the network to be able to learn about them. Uh, what I did here is essentially just go through RFC 2460 and see what was the packet that I could throw on the local network that would elicit a response from Windows. And uh, what, I, I mean, what I found is actually in the spec, so no big deal, is that if you send packets with an unrecognized option that starts with that value, one zero in you know, binary, uh, essentially that will trigger an error on all of the systems receiving that packet. So to put it in another way, you can send a multicasted ping packet and you know, most of the operating systems will respond, but not Windows, okay? So we have to be able to send something else to actually discover Windows systems. If you just craft a packet that includes an unrecognized option, starting with that value, then Windows will respond with an error, okay? So essentially, you can, what you do normally is send both, both proof packets. That's the more complete way of, of testing. So you send one multicasted, you know, traditional ping packet, another packet with that uh, unrecognized option, and you get to learn about, you know, all of the systems that are connected to the local network. Um, something that is kind of like related, before actually I, should, I, I show the, you know, the tool in action, is that uh, you, uh, you know that whenever you have an IPv6 system, typically you have more than one IPv6 address per network interface, okay? So you might easily have, for example, one link local address, one global address, and one ULA, like a unique local uh, address, like private space. And the question here was, well, how could you possibly actually learn all of those addresses? Because, okay, I can send a proof packet, I can elicit a response from all of the systems, but I would like to you know, be able to learn all of the addresses. Well, the answer to that is send the proof packets, the same ones that we discussed here, but from different source addresses. So if you use a global address as the source address, then the response will come from a global address. If you use a link local address, the response will come from link local. So what you do when you scan a local network, you learn about the prefixes that are being employed on the local network, and you send these two packets from each of those prefixes that are, you have available. Uh, let's see. So the way in which you run this, um, uh, I think it was like this. The tool is obviously very straightforward. So if you run it without any, let's say, further parameters, just minus L 
for local scan. The other one is the network interface, okay? And what you see here is, first of all, the link local addresses, and then global addresses, okay? Again, this was rather easy because I'm scanning a network to which I'm directly connected, okay? This also assumes that, you know, multicast is not being filtered. In the same way, at times, if you try to, let's say, do uh, the similar kind of scan, but for a Wi-Fi network, uh, at times it's not that really able because of the packets that get lost, so be aware of that. Uh, and, you know, the other, the, the other, let's say, detail to pay attention is that in order to be able to learn all of this, the proof packets were sent from a global address, from, let's say, from an address in the same prefix. If there was another prefix in use in the local network, and I wanted to learn addresses from that prefix, then I should have sent another proof packet from that other prefix. This is just a trick, so to speak. And obviously, you know, the, um, I don't even remember the options, but um, the tool has a lot of options. For example, this is to print the MAC addresses if you need them. Uh, maybe you want to say, uh, well, I want to know if uh, this address and this address correspond to the same system. Well, you, then you could print the MAC address and then, let's say, discard those that correspond to the MAC, same MAC address, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it has lots of options. Uh, only print the global addresses, only print the link local addresses, and all of that. 